is a great turnout. Thanks for coming, everybody. I am really excited to present some material on socializing your dog. This is honestly about two weeks' worth of material. I was just struggling with what to put in and what to leave out. It's a, it's a lot. So I'm going to crack through as many slides as I can get to, um, and we'll see how it goes. Um, my name is Trish McMillan. I have an animal behavior consulting business in North Carolina but I'm Canadian, and I have been here for a couple of weeks doing some speaking at conferences. So um, I, this is my last couple of days. They've persuaded me to come to Cairns and, and do some speaking for you guys. So I've been really enjoying your city. It's gorgeous here. So why do we need to know about socializing our dogs? I'm going to talk about puppy socialization, and then I'm going to talk separately about how to meet dogs and how your dogs can meet other dogs. So, what I'd like to do is give you a few extra tips so that you can be translators for your dogs. This is what I feel like I do um, as an animal behaviorist is I um, tell, help people understand what their dogs are saying. So I'm going I'm to try to tune your eyes so that you can better see what your dogs are telling you. And we really want to make sure that our dogs trust us. So we're going to do our best to translate for them, approach them in ways that they like, and have them meet their friends in ways that they like. And, of course, this is all in the name of anticipating any problems and keeping ourselves safe. So I'm going to talk first about puppies and socialization. So um, I see people get adult dogs all the time. They're like, I'm going to take him to the park and socialize him. He's three years old. That's not really socialization. Socialization happens when dogs are puppies. It is the first, between 8 and 16 weeks of age is the sensitive period. It doesn't mean old dogs can't learn. It doesn't mean we can't get them used to the things in their life, but it's really easy at a very young age. And that's the, the critical socialization period, which, or the sensitive period, 8 to 16 weeks old. So where do you take your dog? You, if you're lucky enough to get your puppy during the sensitive period, they will also be getting their vaccinations. And your vet will probably say, do not take this puppy out or they will die. So that we've got to find a happy medium between getting the dog out safely and um, avoiding some of the diseases that puppies are susceptible to before they get all of their vaccines. So there's um, R.K. Anderson is an American veterinarian who wrote a really great letter on the importance of puppy classes, of getting puppies out to socialize them. I can tell you that there are no diseases that can leap off the ground and infect your puppy while they're being carried. I uh, got a four-week-old puppy a number of years ago, and I put her in a baby slim because she really needed to see the world. She didn't have a mom. She didn't have a litter. But I just carried her around, took her to the beach, let her meet people, and she stayed off the ground. Other things you need to know is do not take your new puppy to a place where sick dogs might have been. The worst disease they can get, parvovirus, can live in the ground for quite some time. But if you're out on the esplanade, if you're on concrete, it's a little less of a risk. If you're carrying the puppy, it's much less of a risk. Um, go to places where, when I lived in San Francisco, there was, one, um, there was one area that they steam cleaned every morning. So that was quite safe for, the, for me to take my young puppy to. So you have to sort of balance out. Many more dogs have problems because they're poorly socialized than die of parvo. So Balance it out, figure out with your vet, read up, um, check out the R.K. Anderson letter. Early puppy classes can be a great way to do this, too. Go the right way. So when you're socializing your puppy to people, I've seen people do this really a little, fright, a little scarily for the puppy. They'll have the little puppy in their arm, and they'll say, here, be friends with my puppy, even if the puppy's saying, I don't know this person, I'm a little worried. So there's two ways to do this. One is you can make good things happen when people come over. The other way is just take them somewhere and hang out. So when I took my little puppy to hang out in San Francisco, we might be at the beach. I might be standing back from everything. And I'm going to watch her body language to see when she's ready to go meet new people. And just sort of hanging out until the puppy gets bored can be a little more useful than um, jamming treats into them the whole time and getting them looking at you rather than looking at the people. We want them to absorb the things during the sensitive period that they need to absorb. So here's a puppy meeting some firemen, and you can see that he is allowed to go at his own pace. 
pace. He's not being jammed in the fireman's face. He's allowed to uh, make his own choices. So this is Mia's little pup, Ru Rudy, when he was younger. He's a farm dog, so he needed to see a lot of things. He needed to get familiar with um, vehicles and equipment, but he also needed to meet sheep. And I believe that's an echidna in the middle, which I don't have to socialize dogs to in my country. But um, just allowing him to explore at his own pace. If he's a little bit fearful, you can add in some treats if you need to. It's also really, really easy to teach puppies things with positive reinforcement training when they're tiny. There's a couple of my favorite puppy resources here, the Kiko Pup YouTube channel, Ian Dunbar's Dog Star Daily. They've got lots of free material out there on how to train your puppy with positive reinforcement. This is a little puppy that belonged to a client of mine. She got her just a little bit too young. She doesn't even have all of her teeth yet, but look at how quickly she's learning how to sit and lie down. All right, this is ice cream. She's about five or six weeks old. Mm -hmm. Good girl, we're teaching her to sit. Yes, with a little bit of puppy food. Good girl. Show your face, sit. She wants really badly to high five. We're just moving her into a sit. Yes, marking, feeding. And I got a couple of downs out of her. Let's see if we can get another one. So I'm just letting her lick my fingers and holding them down. Yes, good girl. And now I'm releasing the whole chunk of food to her because she's in her down. What a smart puppy. Who says babies can't learn? Who says? Perfect. Yeah, so she was, she didn't even, when I was feeding her, she didn't even have all of her top teeth yet. Very young puppy, but you can start any time. My little four-week-old puppy was doing sit down high five by the time she was five weeks old. Um, you've got to feed them anyways. You might as well feed them and, and teach them. It's really important for puppies to meet other dogs. It's um, a lot of folks want to keep them until they have all of their vaccines. But if you take the dog to meet your friend's dog in your friend's yard where no sick dogs have ever been and your friend's dog is vaccinated, that's a pretty safe way to start meeting adult dogs. I will caution you. Not all adult dogs love puppies, so check with them first that this is a dog who likes puppies and um, take them over and let them, let them play. Or you can have their dog come over to your house. So here's my friend Amy's older Whippet mix helping introduce a new Whippet to the house. And this, this older Whippet's really good with puppies. She gives them appropriate feedback. doing a really good job of teaching her dog language. There's nothing better to learn dog language from than an older dog. <clears throat> it's really important, too, not to overface your puppy. Here's a puppy who came to my farm. I thought she knew what other dogs were, but I put too many dogs in with her. I should have done this one at a time. And if you look at this puppy's body language, she's clearly saying, this is too much for me. I, I, you're doing this too fast. So this is when to back off. <clears throat> See her trying to avoid, she's got her ears back, she's got her tail tucked. So the reason that video ends there is because I took one of my dogs out and we took it a little more slowly. By the end of the evening, she was playing with all three of my dogs. So um, a few definitions. Let's go through what is desensitization. So imagine you're afraid of spiders. So if I have that puppy who's afraid of larger dogs, just throwing her into the mix at the dog park is, not, is kind of like throwing a tarantula in your lap if you're scared of spiders. Does that make you feel better or worse? So desensitization is something you can do with older dogs as well as puppies. And if I was scared of spiders, maybe I wouldn't start with a real spider. Maybe I'd start with a stuffed spider, maybe kind of far away, kind of a small stuffed spider. You're Australians. You should be terrified of spiders. They all want to kill you here. Um, <laughs> So there's a spider. We're feeling OK with that spider. Let's bring him a little bit closer. Are we still OK with that spider? If not, we might go back. If we're OK, we might bring the stuffed spider a little bit closer. This is not a spider who's going to bite you. This is what desensitization looks like, is just 
exposing them to something um, in a way that's not scary. Counter conditioning, on the other hand, is trying to change the dog's mind about what's in front of them. So if you have an older dog and they're afraid of something, you want to expose them to the thing they're afraid of, and then you want to give them something that's the equivalent of a $100 bill. So um, giving them a little piece of dry kibble might not be enough if they're afraid of dogs. We can move them further away from the dogs and give them a piece of maybe cheese or sausage. And then we do it again. There's the spider. There's your $100 bill. And then we do it again. And you're going to gradually get them closer and closer to a real life situation. So it's really important to find the thing that's your dog's $100 bill. Because I'm not fond of roller coasters. If you put me on a roller coaster and you said, Trish, I'll give you a saltine cracker if you finish riding this roller coaster, I'll be like, see ya, I'll be at the snack bar. But if you had a $100 bill, I might do it. If I'm hungry enough, maybe chocolate truffles would do it. But I'd have to be pretty starving to be on a roller coaster for a saltine. So one of the best things we can do to be a good advocate for our dog is to learn how to speak dogs. I'm going to give you a few tips on canine body language. This is something I could talk about for weeks. This is a very small tip of the iceberg introduction to canine body language. Please go do your own research. There's some great books, DVDs, videos. Continue learning. I'm still learning how to speak dog, and I've had dogs for more than 40 years. So one of the most important things when we're talking about socializing dogs, when we're talking about meeting dogs, when we're talking about our dogs meeting other dogs, is to really understand what the stress signals of dogs look like. So this dog is doing what's called a tongue flick. He's just got a little bit of tongue coming out of his mouth, and then it pops right back in. That's a really subtle stress signal. We should also know what affiliative or friendly signals look like. So here's a dog who's being very welcoming. This is actually the full brother of the dog you just saw who was so worried. Very different personality. The first dog you saw would not want to meet you. Maybe after he's known you for a year, you could pet him. This guy, if I brought him in, this is my pit bull Theodore. He's from a dog fighting bust. He loves <coughs> everybody. If he was in here, he'd be racing around, trying to make out with all of you. He'd be sitting on the chairs. Very, very affiliative, friendly dog. And very different body language, too. We're not exactly like our brothers, are we? They can come up quite different. So here's some signs of fear. Um, this dog has his ears back. His pupils are dilated. His eyes are very round. He is probably doing some of the stress signals, the lip licking, the tongue flicking, the yawns. Other things we need to know is that the concept of consent. We've been talking a lot about consent with the whole Me Too movement the last few years. And I'd like to extend this to dogs. We should really ask for the dog's consent before we do things to them. Um, one of the little Australian kids I met, is he here today? Not here. Oh, hopefully he's watching online. Um, he told me that kids have a bubble. You can't just pick them up and turn them upside down here, apparently. You have to respect their bubble. I thought, oh, that's pretty cool. Did you know that your dog has a bubble, too? And we need to respect our dog's bubble. So here's a dog who is meeting a man in uniform for the first time. The, the, the dog's a little bit fearful. Um, this is the first time meeting someone in uniform. And you can see the dog has the choice of whether to approach or not. And the owner is feeding her some snacks to, to help her feel better about this. So what yeah. kind of shepherd? Oh, she's pure German shepherd. German. And she's, uh, her coat is dark sable. She's out of uh, St. John's New York. Okay. Wow. Uh, just 14. 14, I was just going to ask. Look at the ears, eh? I know. Oh, she's observing the numbers. Yeah. Yeah, they're fantastic dogs. That's yeah, obviously sure. why the OPP goes to. Yeah. Uh, always a couple different variations. Look at that fabulous Canadian policeman who is respecting the dog's bubble. He is not reaching into the dog's face. He's allowing the dog to approach him. The owner is trying to help his dog become a little more OK with people in uniform. That can be scary to some dogs. So we are always going to be the translators, the protectors, and the advocates for our dogs, all except for the stuffed one. You can do anything you want to him. He doesn't have a bubble. A little bit of dog body language. So when you're looking at a dog 
just sort of glancing as you walk by. You might catch a glimpse of a face that looks like this, and I'm sure a lot of you are having different feelings about this dog. Some people see this as a playful dog, some people see this as a potentially aggressive dog, but this is just one snapshot in time, you're just glancing by. It's like seeing one word in a sentence. You can't tell what the sentence is about, you can't tell what the paragraph's about, you can't tell what the book is about. But if you look at a little wider shot, you can see there's more going on. Some of you were nervous about that scary looking pit bulls looking off the screen, but now that you pull back a bit, you can see He's with a friend, both of them have bent elbows. It looks more like play now, right? What if we pull back even more and take a look at the whole paragraph and put it in motion? So yeah, they were playing, but look, there's a third dog. You didn't even see that third dog. She's kind of grumpy, she looks older. the rest of the evening about what's going on with these three dogs, what I know about them. So it's helpful to think of behavior as being on a spectrum rather than saying the Doberman on the left is an aggressive dog, the Doberman on the right is a happy, friendly dog. Um, you might think she looks angry there, you might think she looks happy on the right. That's the same dog on different days, in different circumstances. It's hard to say that I mean, I'm Canadian, you might say, well, she's probably polite then. Maybe, I might not be polite some days. You can't make generalizations based on seeing me once. And with dogs too, let's try to avoid labeling them and look at what's going on around them. So if I'm deciding if I want to approach a dog, one of the things I look at first is where they are on the loose versus stiff spectrum. So if loose is way over on this side of the room and stiff is way over on this side of the room, where does this dog fall on the spectrum? Fall right off that if he was any more loose. What about this dog? Same breed. How many friendly signals can you count this dog saying? Where is he on the loose versus stiff spectrum? side and people laugh at that video but if I had to go into the kennel and get that dog I would be very careful with him because he's not giving me any friendly signals at all and I'd like to teach you to not approach dogs not all people like being hugged and kissed by every single person they meet on the street and not all dogs like it either so if the dog is not giving you friendly signals it is fine to leave them alone and I would urge you to please leave them alone as an advocate for the dog so we need to take things in context. This is a very terrifying looking Doberman, isn't he? You can see all of his teeth. Um, very dramatic. This is my dog, Duncan. And again, this is just a snapshot in time, but what's the whole story? He's actually playing. He makes a lot of faces when he's playing. I'm sure some of you have been playing a sport and somebody catches you making an expression. That's, that's what Duncan's like. He has a lot of good expressions. Those two are, are really good playmates. So teaching you some of the more subtle signals about dogs may help you avoid making the kettle boil. So if this kettle's on the stove, you're going to hear some little crackles and pops before it boils. You're going to feel the bubbles sort of start to shake the kettle. You'll start seeing steam before you hear the whistle. So being able to read some of the more subtle signals of dog body language will help you 
take that kettle off the stove, back off, change how you're handling the dog before they have to whistle and growl and snap and bite. <coughs> so when I'm deciding what to do with the dog, a lot of us look at the tail end and we're like, oh, he's wagging, he wants to interact. Yeah, he might want to interact. It may not be in a positive way. Wagging does indicate arousal, interest in interacting, but it, he might be happy to bite you. He might not be happy to greet you. So I, I look at the dog's eyes when I'm deciding how, how the dog's feeling. And this is, again, hard. We're focusing in on one body part. We're going to put it all together in a minute. But the dog on the left, you can see his eyes are squinty. They're almond-shaped. They're kind of soft. And the reason they're squinty is because the facial tension isn't there. He's very relaxed. He's, uh, if you could see the rest of the dog, he's kind of sleepy there. He's floppy. In the middle is when he became an old dog. He had a bit of doggy dementia. And he would spend hours at night pacing and panting and worried about things. And you can see the facial tension is pulling his eyes up into, a pure, into pretty much a perfect circle. And there's also a lot of white showing. On the right, he's got his eyes squinty, but he's showing a lot of white. And this dog used to freak people out because there was almost always white showing. But I want you to look at where he is on loose versus stiff first, rather than saying, oh, lots of white showing, scary dog. He's actually just looking off to the left. He's looking out the window. Both of his eyes are pointing in the same direction, and his um, Body language is, is soft there. His eyes are squinty. There are some signs of affiliative behavior. These dogs are being friendly. <laughs> Theodore's being friendly towards his sister Maggie there and being friendly towards uh, my friend Kat. He has full choice to leave. He's not being held there. It is his choice to interact. This is what affiliative behavior looks like. This, uh, this is his first time meeting a kid who came to my farm. And again, this is how Theodore greets everybody. You, yeah, you won't bet me, I'll bet you, though. See? <laughs> See? Yes, I got Stay down. So you notice the kid is um, scratching him rather than squashing him. Most dogs do not love being squashed. And Theodore has the full choice to leave if he wants to. And he's choosing to stay there. He's wiggling, he's wagging, he's pressing in as close as he can to the, to the kid. That's how he is with every human he's ever met. Here's some more signs of um, affiliative or friendly behavior. The soft eyes, the squinty eyes. You can see how relaxed both of these dogs' faces are. That often goes with an open mouth. I like dogs who are breathing. You can see the ears are back, the mouth is open. Everything's relaxed and inviting about these, these two dogs. This guy is now begging. <laughs> for some food, so this is an alert. He looks a little more intense here. His eyes are a little more round. His ears are forward. Um, definitely an alert. Some people might be worried about this expression. He's just, he's just begging for food here. <coughs> now, in general, the more white you can see, the more upset the dog is, unless they're a dog who just shows a lot of whites to his eye, like the one I showed you. Um, the dog on the left is having a medical issue. She's having a neurological issue. She might be in pain. She might be confused, but her eyes are very round. You can see a lot of the white. That's called a half moon eye or a whale eye. The dog on the right is my little dog, Lily, who hates having baths. And she is sitting outside the shower curtain saying, please, please, please don't give me a bath. Um, she's quite worried about, about it. And you can see it in her face. Here's a dog with a whale eye for a good reason. <laughs> you can see he's puffing his cheeks a little bit as well. Very wise for young dogs to learn that cats are pointy. The ears are a little bit tougher because it ha you have to take into context what the rest of the body is doing. In general, ears that are forward are more alert, focusing in on something. It, with a dog like Lily on the right, you can see her ears can't do quite as much. Theodore's ears can go from all the way forward to all the way back because the dog fighter had them crop them off, so he's, he doesn't have a full ear. Lily on the right, she can only move the base of her ear, but you can see it can go all the way forward and all the way back. So with a floppy-eared dog, look at the base of the ear to see where, what they're focusing on. 
Now we're getting towards the expressions where the dog's kettle is boiling. Once they start showing their teeth, the dog on the left has what's called an offensive pucker. All of his, his lip is short and pushed forward. The dog on the right is showing what's called a gape. His lip is long and pulled back. So both of these dogs will bite you, don't get me wrong. But you can tell a little bit more about where it's coming from by knowing something about their body language. Here are some worried, fearful faces. Again, there's my, my dog's brother, Wickham, on the left. He's at the vet. You can see all the facial tension. I love my pitties and my dobies because they have such expressive faces. They don't have a lot of hair to cover up all those wrinkles. So I find them easier to read than the fluffy dogs. But both of these are, are faces of concern. Here's Wickham on one of his uh, early days in a home. He is very fearful of these, of these tiles. A lot of dogs don't like to be on slippery surfaces. There's things you can do to help. And his mom is uh, making a trail of cookies out onto the tile. He's trying to get that last one. OK, back to my safe spot. Yeah, hard to believe that's, that's the, from the same family as Theodore, who loves everybody. Another thing to take note of is whether the mouth is closed or open. This is Duncan. He's just noticing something off to the right. He's got his mouth open. He's panting. And then he suddenly closes his mouth so he can concentrate on whether the person who just pulled up is a friend to visit with or not. And look at the rest of the face, too. Both of these dogs have their mouths open. But are they both feeling affiliative, friendly, outgoing? Now, every time you see Wickham, you're going you're gonna to see a face of fear. That's pretty much that, that's how he spends a lot of his life. He, does, he has a sister now who helps a lot. But you can see Duncan on the left, his tongue's just flopping out of his mouth. It's a very relaxed face. He's on, way down on the loose end of the spectrum. You can look at the dog's length of lip. You can see all of these dogs, the lip goes almost all the way to under their eyes. These are all dogs who are worried about something. They, the two on the right are at the vet. You can see all of the facial tension, all of the wrinkles on these guys. As the dog alerts to something in front of them, they might close their mouth and the lip might shorten up a little bit. This is Lily just noticing something down the trail. This is not a sign of aggression. But as the lip gets shorter, the dog is giving more of a threat. And you can see the dog on the right even her whiskers have popped forward. She's shortened that lip up. So that's what they do right before they might growl, snap, bite. So really pay attention to the length of the lip. When the tongue becomes spoon-shaped and gets wider, that is a sign of stress as well. It could be heat stress, or it could be psychological stress. So which of these dogs is hot? Yeah, the one on the left is hot. The one on the right is at the veterinary's off veterinarian's office. Anybody here have a submissive grinner? You got a dog who grins at you like this? It looks scary when you first see it. I almost wet myself the first time a dog came up. I was a little kid. The border Collie came up wiggling and wagging and showing all of her teeth. But um, these dogs, you can see how soft their eyes are. They're usually wiggling and waggling. Everything about their body is soft but they show their teeth, and they get misunderstood a whole lot. So I'll go through a few stress signals before we go into how to meet dogs, because we really need to know these to know if the dog's having a good time. So here's some little things that dogs do that um, indicate they're really subtle indications of stress. This is a lip flick or a tongue flick. Again, you need to take it in context. If the dog's just finished dinner, Maybe they're cleaning some dinner off their face. But if you go up to pet a dog and you reach down and they start lip licking, maybe you're making them nervous. This dramatic look away on purpose can be a stress sign. It can say, be saying, I don't really want what you're offering. My Doberman, if I take her out in public and somebody comes up to pet her, she will do one of these. She's just like, I don't know you. I don't really like being molested by strangers. Um, they'll do this. So here's a dog doing a, lit, a dramatic turn away. See the dog's getting in her face. There's a yawn, and then look away. So that was very deliberate. She's, she's um, defusing the tension there. Sometimes a dog will sniff on purpose. This dog's sniffing just because she's out on the trail. I put some snow in for you Australians. 
But look at the context. So this dog is having a bit of an encounter. Again, watch the dog with the brown spots. He's having a bit of a an, an conversation. And she looks away and she starts sniffing. So this is a displacement signal. She's saying, I mean you no harm. Other things that a dog might do when they're stressed, they might shake off, they might groom themselves. We do this too, we chew on our fingernails, we play with our hair if we're a little bit nervous, and they might just start scratching for no reason. Here's a shake off. Oh, that was a big Doberman. They might also um, start doing zoomies if they're stressed. I do some agility with my, with my little yellow dog, and if um, she's worried about something, she might Start, I see a lot of dogs do zoomies in agility if you're kind of overfacing them a bit. Here's Lily meeting uh, a Doberman for the first time. The little yellow dog is a little worried, and you'll see her um, get her energy out by doing some zooms around the yard. <laughs> That's just, that's just dissipating a bit of excess energy because that Doberman's being just a little too much for her. I just met you. Shake it off. More zoomies. We need more zoomies. <laughs> Your little paw raise. She, this is just a little bit too much for her. So now that I've told you about displacement signals, um, I want you to see what's going on with these with these two yellow dogs. I want you to watch all of the lip licks, the lookaways, the yawns, signs of stress in these guys. And yeah. See, so you're licking your lips? So grandma's not pleased with these two playing right next to her. See that big yawn? Lip lick, lip lick. The boys are kind of oblivious, but these two girls are having a real conversation here. You all right? Yeah. No, no, not all right. Oh, that was too much. <laughs> and you'll also see dogs shake off if you over pet them. So if, if you're petting a dog and when you're done, the dog walks away and shakes off all the cooties, maybe you were a little bit too much for them too, just like that was a little bit too much for those dogs. I'll go through a few things that humans get wrong. Uh, a lot of us think that all dogs want to meet all of us, and we need to make them love us no matter what. Um, I'll tell you, you'll get a little bit further by playing hard to get than by inflicting yourself on them. And a lot of people think all dogs want to have dog friends, and this is not necessarily true either, and it, it's okay for them not to, not to want to. A few other things that we get wrong, I'll go through these one at a time. Sometimes people think a dog who's yawning is bored, but you just saw my dog yawn when she was absolutely not bored. She was quite stressed. We might think because the dog is wagging, they're happy, they want to meet us. Not necessarily. Um, freeze is something I'm going to talk about when a dog holds very still. Whenever I see suddenly in, out of the blue the dog bit somebody, I would really like to see video of what happened because dogs don't usually do things without warning. Maybe if they've got a brain tumor or something, but that's very rare. But really often what we don't read is the freeze. They've given us a warning. We didn't see it. That's not a warning that humans use in their repertory, and that's what gets us bitten. I'll talk about a, about a bit about the guilty look and about belly rubs. So here's a few dogs who are yawning because of stress. You can see how wide they're opening their mouth how they've got their eyes squished closed. And you can almost hear the squeak to these yawns. You ever hear, you hear your dog squeak when they yawn? These are stressed dogs. When we're looking at tails, I want to take into account where the tail is. There's a lot to talk about about tails. This is just a brief, brief introduction to reading dogs. So look at where it is um, compared to what's normal for your dog. Is it up higher? That may indicate a willingness to interact. It might be good willingness. It might be not so good willingness. If it's down lower, they might be fearful or worried, or they might be a greyhound. So know, know what's normal for this dog. So this is my Doberman Maggie. Her normal tail position is pretty upright on the left. On the right, I'm making her pose in front of the sunset, and she's not amused, and her tail is lower. 
So another thing you can look at is how loose and wiggly the dog is. Think about that first boxer. He couldn't even keep his paws on the ground at the same time. You can also look at how curved the spine is on these dogs. This is rugby. He's excited about everything. I don't think I've ever seen his spine straighten out. So here's a dog who's wagging her tail. If you had walked into the room and you saw this dog wagging, would you think she wants to meet you? She's staring out the window. All the hair on her back is up. She's not even looking at me. I'm behind her. But she's wagging. So I don't want you to think that every dog who's wagging wants to interact with you. What she's looking at is a squirrel outside the window, and what she wants to do is go and kill it. So she would be happy to kill the squirrel, but she's not giving me any friendly signals towards me. She's obsessed with something else right there. So this picture is from a blog uh, by Nicole Wilde called The Threat of Stillness. And it's a really good read if you're new to body language. Um, and she talks about how dogs will freeze before they, um, it, it's one of the warning signals that they're a little bit um, over threshold. Um, different species don't really understand freezes. Like I said, it's not in our repertory. If a toddler walks up to a food bowl and the dog freezes, they won't necessarily see that as a threat. Um, chickens also don't understand this. You see the short mouth on that dog, the short lip? Chicken's pretty oblivious. I have seen people be this oblivious to dogs who are clearly freezing, clearly giving them warning. Um, so what do we want to do when we see a dog who's upside down? Dog bellies are the best thing in the world, and we must rub them all, right? I would say wrong. This particular dog, if you look at the, the rest of his body language, there's nothing friendly about this dog. He's rolled over slowly. He's quite stiff. You can see the whites of his eyes. He's doing a tongue flick. So he's doing what's called a tap out. If you're wrestling and you want to say enough, you can tap the floor twice and say, please stop. This dog is saying, please stop. And I have seen people go up to dogs who have rolled over in a knock it off kind of way and rub that belly. And you can put yourself in a lot of danger. This dog is asking to stop, and we misread it. So if you look at these two dogs, one of them is on the loose end of the spectrum. One of them is on the, the um, stiff end of the spectrum. I don't think the guy playing upside down with his toy necessarily wants a belly rub, but you can see how much looser and floppier he is. His tail's flopped out between his legs. The one on the right, her tail's tucked. She's looking away. You can see the whites of her eyes. She's very stiff, but a lot of people would rub her belly anyways. You guys now know better. Get out there and tell the rest of Cairns, um, this is a tap out. This is not a dog who's asking for attention. So one big concept that I'd love to get across to you guys is the concept of giving dogs choice. I, I do dog, cat, and horse behavior consulting. And when I first meet an animal, I have had people say, this cat never comes out from under the couch when people are here. What are you doing differently? And I will tell you, I am giving them choice. Playing a little bit hard to get will actually get you further. The people who love animals the most are often the ones driving them away with too much attention. This is a really good video about choice. So watch this girl. She would, like her, she would like to give her dog a hug. Dogs don't particularly like being hugged. The only time dogs hug one another is when they are fighting or when they are mating. They're not really wired to enjoy that frontal frontal contact. Look at this dog as he's saying, please give me a hug. No, look at the stiffness, look at the lip licks, look at the, the whale eye. But watch what happens when she takes her hand away. Dog comes right over. Is this dog enjoying this hug? Watch the dog's eyes, watch the dog's lips. So this is a go away kiss. You'll see dogs give this. This is a kiss to dismiss. Is the dog enjoying this hug? No, most dogs don't enjoy hugs. They'll tolerate it. It's a very tolerant dog. Didn't growl, didn't bite her. But now she's got the choice again. Dog's out of there. 
What about this little dog? This is a fearful little dog that I look after sometimes. Is she enjoying this interaction? See the lip lick? Yeah, that, um, she's saying, I'm a little worried about this. Person's not particularly hearing it. How about this dog? Look at where the tail is, look at where the ears just went to. You're going to see some lip licks here. Lip lick, lip lick. And look at the body weight shift. Not fun for her, was it? So the moral of the story is we don't have to pet all the dogs. Give them some choice. Let them come to us. There's a dog doing a lip lick. Not sure if he just finished a snack or if he's enjoying this. It's hard to tell from just one word. And if you do interact with a dog, a good idea is to use the three-second rule. So um, if you see a dog like this, everything's friendly, everything's welcome, try to giving them a scratch. Dogs don't really like being petted, but they like being scratched. So try a little scratch on the chest, try a little scratch under the collar, and then stand back and see what the dog says. Do they want more or do they shake off and move away? So I'm going to torment this poor little shy dog again. Um, tell me if I made her better or worse. We want to make the dogs better every time we interact with them. What? Is she saying, please pet me? Is anything about this? I couldn't bring myself to pet her on the head for the video. But shoving my hand in her face is not making her feel better. We should stop doing that. That's more than three seconds. Do the lip lick. Does she feel better about me after that interaction? I felt better. She's very soft and warm. Didn't make her feel any better. So there's nothing magical about your hand. There's nothing. I wish they would quit teaching people to shove hands into dogs' faces. That's, that's kind of scary for a lot of them. Your hand has zero magical properties. And this is where we get bitten more often than not, is the hand and the lower arm. And often the thing that happens right before that is we shoot that hand out. So I want you to watch this dog. Um, tell me if there are any friendly signals towards the person um, holding the camera. But you'll see the person shove their hand in the dog's face multiple times. It's OK. It's OK. Is the dog showing any friendly signals towards the person? What's the dog looking at? Yeah, so this, this is a redirected bite. The dog is looking at something else. The person comes in and pokes them, and they're just, that, that was very polite. That was get out of here, sort of snap. But there's nothing about your hand that makes the dog like you. So, so please stop shoving your hand in dogs' faces. Um, if, a lot of us believe our dogs feel guilty if we come home and we see that something's torn up and we yell at them. A lot of dogs will give us a look like this. If you'd like to look up some research on it, it's kind of been debunked. The dog is um, reacting to our reaction. They don't really remember what they did four hours ago. And here's what Berlin did today. And when she was questioned about it, she's now holding out in the shower. She's praying that we <laughs> blame somebody else. Behavior nerd, I find these videos so sad. These dogs who are acting guilty, they're actually just reacting to the anger in their, in their owner's voice and their mannerisms. Uh, Julie's research had, they would tell, they would leave a cookie on the table and what, the owner would walk out and sometimes the researcher would take the cookie away and the dog would still act guilty because the owner would come in and say, hey, and the dog didn't even take the cookie, but they'll still act guilty. Here's my dog, Theodore, who is an artist. And um, he's never been yelled at for this, so he doesn't feel guilty at all. Here's a cool video by Instinct Dog Training. It's an organization in New York City that um, does board and train and lessons for, for dogs. And I love this video on greeting dogs. If your friends couldn't make it tonight, it's available on instinctdogtraining.com. But it was a really good illustration of how to greet dogs and how to not greet dogs. 
When it comes to saying hello to a new canine friend, there are some things humans do that dogs find rude, uncomfortable, and downright scary. Let's review five big don'ts for greeting a new dog. Number one, the hand. Sticking your hand in a dog's face invades their personal space. Notice how Moses turns his head away to avoid. Number two, the lean over. Leaning over a dog is intimidating for them. See how Moses licks his lips and turns his head? That means he's uncomfortable. Number three, the head pat. Getting thumped on the head is icky. For nervous dogs, an unknown hand reaching over the top of their head can be scary too. Number four, the face hold. This super invasive greeting includes lots of eye contact at close range and holding their face in both hands makes a dog feel like they can't move away. Number five, the hug. This greeting behavior is also really invasive and scary for many dogs. It's full body restraint at very close quarters. The best case scenario with each of these five interactions is that a dog will tolerate, but not enjoy them, like Moses. However, many dogs will show aggression, lunging, snapping, or biting to try and create some space for themselves and stop the uncomfortable interaction. And it's a totally understandable response. So please keep pups comfortable and keep yourself safe by following these low stress greeting guidelines instead. Present yourself with your body slightly sideways. Invite the dog to approach if desired by presenting your open palms. Stay calm and quiet with a relaxed and happy expression on your face. Keep eye contact to a minimum. Gently pet the dog on their back or side. After three to five seconds, Pause to see if the dog re-engages with you to request more petting. Following these simple guidelines gives dogs lots of choice and control over the greeting. They choose if they want to engage and they choose when it's over. Remember, you should always get permission from the owner and the dog before saying hello. Happy greetings! Some really easy tips. I mean, we're all here because we're dog lovers. We want all the dogs to love us, but try playing a little hard to get. And most importantly, give that dog choice. Give them, uh, don't restrain them in a way that makes them feel like they have no choice. So the last little bit I'll go through here today is on how to introduce your dog to other dogs. This is something I see a lot of people attempt to do in ways that, that really stress the dog out. Um, again, this is not an exhaustive list. There's lots more to learn, but I'll just give you a few general tips. So um, one of the reasons we really love dogs is because humans and dogs are two of the species that play throughout their whole lives. Even, even my old dog, Grandma there, she would still chase a ball until her arthritis got so bad that she physically couldn't get up and chase it. So play is communication about communication. It is practicing real world behaviors. A lot of young animals will practice everything they need to do in adulthood in play. We do this in play too. We might play house, we might play work, we might play uh, all of the things that the adults are doing. One of the great things that play can do for dogs, I've been working with shelter dogs for a lot of years. This, I've been over here for some shelter conferences this fall. And Play can be really magic if you've got a fearful dog. I used to try to get fearful dogs to change their minds about me by handing them bacon and throwing them sausages in their kennels. And sometimes they just hide the whole time I'm throwing bacon in the kennel. And then when I leave, their kennel's full of bacon. Hooray, the person's gone and I've got bacon. And, and you can actually make them worse this way. But I've found that a lot of dogs will believe another dog before they'll believe a human. So I want you to watch, this is a video from Dogs Playing for Life. It's an organization that helps teach shelter dogs how to play. And I want you to watch the little tan dog. She had to be carried to the play yard. She could not walk on a leash. She was terrified of the people. But watch what the um, other dog tells her and how her body language changes. Okay, so it's June 2nd at Barks, and this little, no, this little really tan dog, yeah, this not, little female. Well, yeah, no, it's a good one. This, uh, this little tan female back here is like a pancake dog with people, scared to death with people. And so she just came out and we're using Nateo, who's the bomb proof dog here, to show us how she feels about dogs, which apparently she knows that she's a dog. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> so the 
the dog is telling her it's okay out here. You notice there's no people in there with her at this point. But if every day somebody different takes her out to the play yard, she's going to start walking there on her own. She's going to start feeling better about people because people lead to other dogs. And that's the thing that's helped my, my dog's brother, Wickham, the most is that his owner adopted a second dog who's super confident. And when Wickham's worried about something, she just goes up and takes all the social pressure off. Like, hi, I'm the one to greet you. Leave my brother alone. And she helps him feel better about the world because he sees how she interacts with it. So not all dogs need to play. Some, some dogs love it. Some dogs don't. When I was a much younger person, I enjoyed going to a nightclub and being squashed in there with lots of other young people. I thought that was a fun thing to do. Now that I am not so young, there is not a number of saltines or triscuits or $100 bills you could give me to make me spend, well, maybe $100 bills. It would, um, it would take a lot for me to spend an evening in a nightclub squished in there with a lot of people. And dogs, too, become a little less interested in meeting every single dog as they got older. You saw Grandma Dog there. She was not thrilled even with her brothers playing in front of her. As an older person, I would enjoy much more playing a game of Scrabble at home with some friends that I know really well. So if your dog is a Scrabble at, with friends kind of dog, you do not have to take them to the dog park and make them party with the nightclub kids. It is perfectly OK to um, let them hang out with their friends. I don't need to meet every single person on the street and give them a big hug and a kiss. Um, I'm Canadian. We don't do that. And um, your dog doesn't have to either. I'll talk just a little bit about play. I find a lot of people mis, uh, misread what the dogs are doing when they're playing. I can tell you if you watch my Pitbull and my Doberman play, I'll show you a video of it in a minute. You might think they're killing each other. But they're fine. I, I know these dogs well. I know their play styles. But we do need to step in sometimes. So here's some of the play styles that people talk about. They, you might have dogs who are kind of gentle and dainty. Often small dogs fall into this category, where they're in the same orbit, and they're sort of both trotting around, maybe with a toy in their mouth, but not really interacting heavily with one another. Some dogs prefer to chase. That's a fun thing for dogs. Um, some like to be the bunny. Some like to be the fox. Um, a lot of dogs like to wrestle. I love my uh, pitties, my bully breeds. They, they are really close contact wrestlers, a lot of them. Not all of them. Some are gentle and dainty. Some are chasers. Um, but it's important to know your dog when you're trying to get, make them a friend. So I, I promise you this. Brace yourself. Here's my pit bull and my Doberman on my little farm in North Carolina. You might think they're killing them, one another, but they're fine. You'll notice the pit bull rolls over on his back a lot. He's playing defense. He can use all of his claws against the Doberman if he needs to when he's upside down. Most patient horses in the world. <laughs> and this is early in the morning. They can get pretty growly. They can get even more intense than this. But all of this is good play. It's very bouncy, a little bit of shake off. I'm not sure if that's dust or stress. Just gave you a back. <laughs> you can see there's lots of bent elbows, lots of bouncing. This is why our guys are always dirty. Let's go. Come on, guys. Let's go. rough and they can, they can get even rougher than that, um, but, but they're, they're fine with that. Here's a couple of dogs who like to chase. This golden retriever has never played with another dog in her life. She's at a friend's house for some board and train, and they decided to put her in with a whippet because they knew the whippet could outrun her, and um, she got upset when dogs got frontal to her. That's very threatening in dog body language. So having the Whippet running away actually worked really well for her. This is her first play session ever. Of course, the Whippet likes to be the bunny. So there was a 
little bit of chasing when my two were wrestling as well. They can flex back and forth. It's not like they, um, many dogs have different play styles they can change to. So if you're not sure, um, here's my friend's dog, Dino, and he is standing over Theodore in a way that I'm I might find a little uncomfortable. If you look at his eyes, they're a little bit hard there. So anytime I feel like Theodore might be uncomfortable, what I can do is I usually leave a leash dragging on the unknown dog. So if I picked up Dino's leash and walked away, Theodore will tell me. That's, that's called a consent test, taking away the bully and then seeing what the victim says. So if I walk Dino away and Theodore gets up and says, hey, what are you doing with my friend? Bring him back. Maybe that looks stupid. Maybe it looked like it was too much, but they were fine. If I pick up Dino's leash and walk him away and Theodore says, oh, thank goodness, shake off the cooties, that guy was too much, then I know I was right to interrupt. And you can do consent tests as often as you like to see if your dogs are okay with the play that's happening. So some positive signs when dogs are having a good time playing. You will often see the ears back. Sometimes they will rotate so they're almost touching one another, so like Dino's are at the top. You'll see some sort of popping movements, that really exaggerated bounding that my dogs were doing in the arena with the horses. I really like elbow bends. You see the extreme elbow bend on the bottom. That's called a play bow. That's an uh, invitation to play. It's not working on Duncan that particular time, but. Theo has to try. A few of the warning signs. Again, this is not a comprehensive list. This is just an overview. Um, here's Kenya with her hackles up. Is she having trouble with this particular interaction? Is she looking at a squirrel? I'm not sure. You need to take into account the context. When the dog's getting stiff or freezy, like that dog over the food bowl with the chicken, the hard eye and the freeze, those are definitely things to uh, take note of and in interrupt. So what I tell my dogs when they're playing like idiots, like this, is if you're, if you're not both having fun, it's not fun. They were both having fun here. They're really rough players, these two. But if I wasn't sure, I could do a consent test. If I didn't know these dogs too well, I could take the one away that I think is being a victim. There are some dogs who will tip into a fight as they get to a certain level of arousal, it might tip into a fight. If you know this about your dog, you need to step in before that happens. You always, always, always want to protect puppies, and you always need to protect inexperienced dogs. They are um, a young dog. You saw that little puppy in the video earlier on. That was one of her first encounters with other dogs. And you want those first encounters to be really good. She was in her critical socialization period. The guy was working on, his, on the farm and left the puppy in the truck. And I said, can she come and play with my dogs? Because I know my dogs are very friendly with other dogs. And I, and I knew a little goes a long way at that age. And I would love her to be a, a pit bull who likes other dogs. So let's put it all together. Let's um, look at some of the things that are happening here and see if you recognize any of the body language I've talked about so far. Is Champs and Taz. This is not Taz. It's just kidding. This is Champs and Rocco. Oh, this is the sleeps too much dog. Rocco was returned for sleeping too much. We want him to be the guy. Yeah. Yes, that's what they wanted. In there, where are these dogs on the loose versus stiff scale? Everybody's really floppy, relaxed. They're going back and forth really nicely, lots of bent elbows, um, really some nice play there. And it was cool that they had the picnic table. If the dog felt overwhelmed, he could get underneath the picnic table, regroup, and come out when he was ready. So when you're introducing two dogs, this is about the worst thing you can do is introduce them on very tight leashes. Nobody makes good decisions while they're being strangled. <laughs> and I think part of the issue with city dogs in particular is that we force them onto sidewalks. So if I was meeting you for the first time, sorry, you got stuck in the front row. I'm going to keep using you as a victim. 
the polite way, as a Canadian, I'm assuming this is true in Australia too, for us to meet is for me to come up to you, we square off our shoulders to one another, make eye contact, I shoot out a hand, we shake hands. That's a very polite greeting in human language. If a dog goes up to another dog at the dog park and they are frontal and they are straight on and they're looking into their eyes and they shoot out a paw, that is very confrontational in dog language. And I think a lot of the issues we have with city dogs is they're on sidewalks. And what do sidewalks do? It makes them be frontal to one another and they're put on artificially, um, they're, they're forced to give each other kind of a hard stare in the eyes. But if you watch dogs off leash at the dog park, when they meet, they come up and they get sideways to one another. They'll circle, they'll sniff one another's rear ends, they, they'll approach at an angle. So if we had circular sidewalks, we wouldn't have so many problems with dogs. The other issue is we don't teach our dogs to walk nicely on a loose leash. Many of us just let them pull. So if, if their dog's coming towards the other dog and they're, they're strangling themselves, and they're going, ha, 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 that's very scary for other dogs. So, you know, using a harness rather than a collar that makes them do that and teaching them to walk nicely beside you can be really helpful in, in preventing these tight leashes because these two dogs are not being set up for success right now. And they might explode, I'm sure. So who in here has a dog who is an idiot on leash, likely to explode, lunge, bark, but is fine off leash. Lots of us, I've had plenty of these dogs too. This is really normal. So just because your dog is not great on leash doesn't mean they hate all other dogs. It might be an artifact of how you're introducing them. So here's a really dramatic example from my friend Mike Shikashio, who I lecture with in the state. This is a client's dog. And watch what happens when he tightens the leash. He's just sniffing this stuffed dog on the ground. She's not quite sure if it's real or not, but watch what happens when he, when he tightens the leash. Sorry, it's loud. dog tension on the leash is like pulling a trigger on the gun. As soon as, as, soon as that tension comes on, she's going to explode. And I'm, a lot of us here have dogs like that. So if we want them to make friends, if you have a friendly dog, if you don't have a dog who you know is friendly off leash, a great way to do that is have them meet the other dog off leash. When I do a lot of fostering, and when I'm bringing in a new dog, I like them to meet on neutral territory. So we might use a friend's yard, we might use a uh, a different off-site area so that my dogs aren't saying, hey, this is my spot, and the other dog's not saying, hey, this is my spot. It's uh, neutral territory is usually safest. If you're not sure if your new dog likes other dogs, you might have a fence in between them and see how they do with the fence. Some dogs are worse through a fence, but many of them, they can at least display natural body language. They can run up and down and um, talk to one another through the fence. If you're really not sure, it doesn't hurt to teach your dog to wear a muzzle. If you're bringing in a new dog, you're not sure if your dog likes other dogs, um, having them wear, make sure it's the kind of muzzle they can breathe in. I like the Baskerville muzzles. They are um, fitted so that the dog can open their mouth, they can drink water, they can pant, especially in this climate. You should never muzzle a dog with a muzzle that closes their mouth. So this little Kelpie mix was a dog who was quite reactive in the shelter. She would lunge and bark and make all kinds of noise. They thought she might be dog aggressive, but look what happened when we let her off leash with these. I knew the other two dogs were friendly. And tell me if she's dog aggressive. them a few more minutes and uh, by the time the little interaction was over she was soliciting play rolling around on her back with these other dogs. So here's a dog who's meeting Theodore. I actually did this introduction on Theodore's territory because he loves all dogs so much I was not worried about him defending it. The pointer has not been around other dogs for many years. I wasn't sure how she was going to feel about meeting my dogs but I was bringing her in to foster. So they're going to greet each other through the fence, and I want you to tell me if you would let you her like in him? to meet Theodore. Say Theodore. <laughs> I know. Is he sexy? You want to play with him? 
How did that look? Notice, what my, notice my tone when I'm doing that introduction. Am I saying, you be nice? I taught my first dog to attack on the words, you be nice, with me tightening the leash. So I'm um, acting happy, acting jolly, even if the dog's not looking friendly. And she was looking fine. By keeping her tone light, was I hauling back on her leash and making her strangle? Nope. <laughs> nope. That is, I did have to have a leash on her. There wasn't, a, there wasn't another fence outside. But that looked pretty good, right? So I'm going to let her in with the leash dragging in case she changes her mind. And again, she hasn't met a dog in a lot of years. Theodore can hardly stand himself. There's a new girl. <laughs> so he's a little much for her, but he backed himself off. That looked pretty good, right? So I took her leash off. I kept her a few days, and this is what they looked like a couple days later. Theo likes to check them all for fleas. <laughs> She's being a lot more brave now, isn't she? Theo's teaching her how to be a dog, how to play with dogs. So here's the pack of dogs I had about 10 years ago. Um, all but one of them have passed away now. Um, when I'm out with my personal dogs, whether I have one or more, I don't actually let them meet other dogs on leash. I'm a dog trainer, I'm a control freak, and I don't trust all of you to know your dogs. <laughs> Uh, not that you live where I do. I don't trust the people in my area to know their dogs. They may have just adopted the dogs and be like, I need to socialize them with other dogs. They might not know if that dog is friendly. So I want my dog's job is when we're out for a walk like this, they need to pay attention to me. If we see other dogs, we'll give them some space. That's a big pack of dogs. <laughs> we, we'll, we might cross the road or get out of their way. Um, but I, do, I would never let all five dogs rush up to any dog and greet them. They might be too much all as a pack. And not all of them like meeting strange dogs. Out of this bunch, two of them really didn't like meeting new dogs. Three of them did. So if you're doing an on-leash greeting, I, I would like to emphasize your dog does not have to greet every dog that you meet. It's, it's, um, I prefer for my dogs to meet dogs that I know are social, that I know they're going to have a good time with. The other thing I want you to understand is I have had some really dog aggressive dogs, some dogs that if your dog came charging up, would bite them. And it frustrates me to no end when I've got one of these dogs out and you're out there with your friendly Labrador off leash in an area where you're supposed to be on leash and your dog comes charging up to my dog aggressive Akita mix and you say, it's okay, he's friendly. Your dog being friendly is not going to make my Akita mix love having a Labrador in his face. And you're putting your dog at risk. People who have dogs who don't love other dogs need a safe place to walk them. So um, if you're going to let your dog off leash, they should have a really good recall. You should be able to call them off other dogs. And they don't have to meet everybody. <laughs> give, give, give those of us who have a, um, dogs who don't love other dogs a spot to be. Sometimes if you've got a dog who doesn't love other dogs, if I've got my dog aggressive Akita mix out and we're just passing on the street, I might pull out some string cheese and give him K-900 dollar bills as we go past because I'm going to try to make him feel a little bit better about being around your dog. This is, if you have a dog who's reactive on leash, that might work if you've got something that's good enough. If I have Theodore out with me and he's dying to meet your dog, and you have a puppy who's wiggly and waggly and saying, can I meet Theodore? Maybe I will let him greet. But it's going to be quick, because even if he wants to play, and I let him come up to your puppy, and they start rolling around in the middle of the hardware store having a great time playing, they're just going to get tangled in their leashes. They're going to strangle themselves. They're not going to be able to have a great time. So if we're going to say hi, we'll go up, we'll do a little interaction, and let's go. 
because um, even if they're having a great time, they can't really play well on leash. And it's not fun to get them tangled. When I'm introducing new dogs, I might take them out for a walk in parallel. We might start on opposite sides of a country road, sort of sniffing interesting things, and sort of gradually get closer and closer. So one of these dogs is not keen on other dogs, but she's doing quite well being pretty close to them. And her owner has some $100 bills, some um, treats in a can that he can spray through that muzzle when she's, uh, as she's getting closer to help her feel better about this. Here's Theodore doing some therapy with a little dog who's afraid of street noises. So this parallel walk is for a reason, and I'm holding both of them with the same, with the same hand. Um, these are dogs who've met who are good together. You can see how confident she feels with, with the big tough pit bull beside her. Everything's all right. If I'm introducing dogs who are not great side by side yet, I might do a linear walk. I might put one in front so that they can pee on things in a line. One pees on something, the other one comes up and pees on it. They get each other's scent this way without that frontal frontal contact. We'll start with one behind, and then we'll switch them around so the other one's in front. And by the time we get back from that walk, they might be parallel. They might be OK with one another. There's a dog that I brought home last year. She, was, uh, she had kennel cough, and she was not great with other dogs. So I put her in the dining room. You can see I've got a very sturdy mounted metal baby gate on the front. And I've also got a secondary X-pen so that she can't snap at another dog through that baby gate. She also had some kennel cough, so I started off with a sheet over that baby gate as well, just as a sneeze barrier. Um, there's, there's lots of other things you can do. You can put them on tethers. I like to keep the new dog behind the baby gate until everybody's bored. We'll go out for our walks, and we'll come back. And I, I was able to integrate her eventually. But we took it really slowly with her. So here's my dog, Kenya, who, I, who sometimes doesn't like other dogs. This is grumpy old grandma. And she's meeting a new foster Doberman. And this dog has been for a, a parallel walk with everybody else in the household. He's very dog friendly. He's doing great with the other four. This is my problem child. And um, I've been letting her watch from behind a baby gate. The Do Doberman's in an X-Pen. There's been no explosions, no reactions. So I'm going to let her come out off leash because she's not as good on with the leash strangling her. And tell me what you think of this body language. She's taken the long way around because he's enormous. See that shake off? See the lip licks? A little uncertain. Doberman's being very appropriate, isn't he? He's really tired from walks with four other dogs. See the nice long paw raise he's doing? Yeah. Okay. Am I yelling at Kenya? Am I saying, you be nice? He's a good nope. Girl. That's Damien. He's sexy. <laughs> Damien shakes off. He's like, she's a little creepy. So you saw the little stress signals, right? So are they ready to go out for a walk side by side? Maybe, maybe not. I waited till the next morning with those two. We did that again in the morning. They ended up being quite good friends. They. Um, one thing with Kenya was she was never, ever aggressive with a dog who was bigger than her. She's not stupid. So I mostly fostered Dobermans. I, I actually ended up keeping that Doberman. He became St. Duncan. I don't like the name Damien, so uh, I, I kept him for the rest of his life. So what have we learned? Socialization is for puppies. When you are getting your adult dog used to something, that's 
remedial socialization or that is desensitization and counter conditioning. That doesn't mean older dogs can't learn. It's, it's definitely worth working with a trainer. Uh, we learned how to greet dogs and we learned how to give the dogs their bubble, respect what they're saying, play a little bit hard to get. And we did a little bit on dog introductions. This is a very small overview of what you can do with your dogs, but um, thank you for coming. I've, it's been great being here, and I'll hang out for a couple questions afterwards. <laughs>